Thanks for joining the Nature Bats Last channel, everybody who's watching. I'm here today with psychologist Peter Miller, and we wanted to talk about something that joins together the work I've done and the work that Peter is doing. I, specifically, I observed intergenerational criminal activity when I was working on campus. I was part of a program called Poetry Inside Out, and inside referred to incarceration facilities. Specifically, when I was there, it was the girls pods of the Pima County Juvenile Detention Facility and the men's pods of the Pima County Jail. In addition, there was an in-between. So that was the in. The out was a high school class, almost always in an English class, in which all of the students, in fact, all the students in the school earned their way into that school because to get there, you had to get kicked out of at least three other public schools. So it, it only took less than a year before I added my own honors course. And so we had four different legs of the Poetry Inside Out program. And I observed intergenerational criminal activity. Almost all of the men in the Pima County Jail had children in the Pima County Juvenile Detention Facility, right? So, so the so-called bad people, almost all of which, by the way, were people of color, in the jail had bad people who were in the Pima County Juvenile Detention Facility. People in jail, the men in jail, would frequently refer to how they want to make things better for their children, for their daughter, for their son, whatever. And they just couldn't see a way to do that because their lives were stuck in jail off and on and being homeless off and on and so on. So. I, th I thought that the this intergenerational criminal activity certainly applied to mental health. I could see it, especially depression and the subsequent effects on the natural world were pretty evident as well. If you spend all of your time being homeless, trying to make enough money to, to get into a home or in jail, if you, if you spend most of your time in, in those three places, including an incarceration facility, then are you going to care at all about planting a tree in your yard in the house you're going to live in for only another three months? Are you going to pick up every piece of trash you see on the on the roadway? Are you going to be, get concerned about recycling? No, no, I didn't see any of that going on. And so I thought maybe since Peter is the psychologist, mm -hmm. we could have a conversation about the intergenerational activities that occur in the world with impacts on nature in the school system and almost certainly with respect to the people you call your clients, right? Yeah, I think intergenerational trauma uh, could apply to uh, various subtypes and cultures. Um, it, it's um, often, I think it's focused on the more of the minority or vulnerable types of uh, cultural groups. Um, I am of the thought and belief that if you live in the context of industrialization or capitalism, you're going to be impacted on to some level, in some degree, in some way. Um, and we've talked about people being on spectrums for this or that disorder um, in previous uh, videos. But like, and of course, like, is, is, this, is this effect on people are there going to be ripple effects in how in how we live our lives and the way that we prioritize things? I mean, one of the things that has stood out to me over and over and over again working in mental health is the whole priorities issue. So, or even having things to insert into your priorities, like mental health is at the bottom of <laughs> uh, priorities. And it only makes sense that it continuously is because when you talk to somebody in therapy, it's like they're learning about mental health for the first time ever. Like they've never heard of certain things about how to manage your thoughts or your emotions. It's all new, brand new. Uh, one of the words that I would use in terms of emotions is called emotional validation. And they would say like, what's that? Right? <laughs> what emotional validation? 
uh, you know, we, me and my family, we just dismiss emotions, ignore emotions, we repress emotions, we even shame emotions. Um, so, you know, I really don't know what you're talking about, Peter. Why would I do that? Why would that be good for me? <laughs> so there's, in addition to it being at the bottom of the barrel for priorities, there's a total and complete lack of understanding, total ignorance. Um, and I don't blame anybody for it because it's like I was the same, right? The only reason that I was able to learn more about mental health and, and be able to put out some fires in my life and manage my own disorder was because I was just, I was just fortunate enough to go into psychology and to be around the right people who could explain things to me in ways that I understand them so that I could apply them to my life and put out some fires along the way. Like I, I guarantee you, if I hadn't have taken that path and learned those things, my life would have probably exploded, right? Like, like so many other people's lives and their relationships and their families. Like if you don't have the skills, tools, knowledge, understanding, it's almost guaranteed. Like, there's a reason the divorce rate is so high, right? <laughs> like, right. it's like what, 50, 60, 70%? Like, it, oh, it's, it's, it's enormous. I, I think it's everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Given so, I mean, <laughs> in, in, this, in this country, it's more than 50% after the first seven years. Right. So, so if you last seven years, you're doing great. If you <laughs> last 12, it's amazing. And, uh, I, there's there's underlying reasons for that that people I think don't understand or appreciate uh, and people are affected more or less by these neglects that come through living in capitalism. Uh, I guess I should say like you know I'm thankful for the ways some of the ways capitalism has provided for me but I'm also I think it's absolutely necessary that we call out capitalism for the harms that it does and in our talks, right, Guy? Like, this is kind of what we're doing. We're saying it's not it's not all a bowl of cherries. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I can drive a car that is uh, pretty reliable. I drive a Mitsubishi Outlander 2018 Touring Edition, right? <laughs> and it's a reliable vehicle. For the most part and i'm thankful that i don't have to walk everywhere thank you capitalism for giving me that um but at the same time because everyone has been so hyper fixated on trying to pay their bills and figuring out where the next meal is going to come from uh my family included when i was growing up and because of all the different ways society tries to get you addicted to different things to cope with living in this place um lives can be often very miserable as well. Um, and I think in the, when you were doing the poetry groups and classes, the students were reflecting on some of these things, right? Like this is how, this is how capitalism and industrialization has not served me. Um, uh, I've had broken relationships and attachments with my key figures in my life, my mother, my father, um, I haven't, I didn't get all of my needs met and my brain development was probably compromised. I surely, I guess they probably didn't put it in those words. They would just probably speak more to the outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And also there's some really interesting things I learned in by spending time in incarceration facilities. I went to a supermax prison in Tucson and it was amazing. The things that I saw, for example, no signs of life except for the inmates and the guards that's it and so i was asking about that and the person giving the tour said oh yeah if a weed ever shows up we we pull it or poison it right away <laughs> they can't see any life it might give them hope that's why the windows in their cells are so high so they can't look out and see creosote bush they can't see any of the native plants Occasionally, they might catch a bird going by through their wind, jail window. But that's it. That's the only life they're going to see. And that's all by design. The, the whole complex in this country, the prison industrial complex, is designed to destroy hope. It's designed to make the people who are in there have no positive outlook for the rest of their lives. The goal, yeah. the goal is to take these broken people and break them even more. Yes, punish the vulnerable, uh, punish the broken, punish the ones who have suffered the most, 
uh, Gabor Mate talks about this. If you want right. to look that up too, uh, he would say, you know, we're at we're not at war with drugs. We're at war with the people who have been affected the most by living in this context. <laughs> right, and and yet I f- I found some amazing things. There's, you know, I talk about this guy all the time, and I can't remember his name. He wrote the book Going Back to Bisbee, mm-hmm. so he was a writer, and he volunteered to live in a in a supermax state prison that was about a two hour drive from campus. He would go up there once a week and try to teach people creative writing Mm -hmm. and therefore how to get along in life. And one person went there functionally illiterate, didn't could barely spell his own name. Mm -hmm. And he came out an award-winning poet who had a courtesy appointment at an Ivy League school. So it's amazing. Incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, this person just did amazing work. And he was hearing a lot of rumors this particular day. And he thought something must be going on, but he didn't know what. So he was in class with with the incarcerated men. And he asked them what's going on. They told him, no, you don't need to worry about anything. And this went on for a while. And then eventually the whole system broke down. There was a big riot in the prison. And the first thing the inmates did in his class was circle around him with their backs to him. Hmm. He was their highest priority. If anybody came in that door, they had to go through him. Hmm. They had to get, go through the inmates to get to him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> and, I, and I thought that was an amazing story. And then I experienced it sort of firsthand. There, I, I was touring the Supermax federal prison in tucson arizona and there was this woman that was teaching and she was younger and better looking than all the men who were taking the course right so she was teaching creative writing and they were all taking their notes and and we walked and we could see it from the outside and i'm like doesn't that that seem a little dangerous she's in there by herself and the, the person giving the tour said they'll never touch her this is a reward they get for good behavior. They get to take this course. This is an amazing thing for them, but they're not going to throw it away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and so I observed this, I read about it, and then I observed it firsthand. <laughs> the, yeah. you know, for the most part, these people who are being detained are decent people. Right, yeah. Um, I agree. I think that... Um... I don't think people are born corrupt. Um, when I was taking some of my studies in university, I remember I would include some pictures of humans in some of my writing. And I, I you know, I, you put a picture of a baby in there. Is this baby born corrupt, right? Is this baby bound to be a criminal or to do harmful things just because they're born in, just because they're born or born in a particular cultural, with a particular cultural group, right? Um, um, I think I really think people get corrupted by the programming they receive, the society that contributes to that programming. Um, I don't believe that we live in a society that nurtures optimal brain development. Um, it, it fosters all kinds of lies and deceit in terms of the narratives people receive through their religious beliefs. It talks about life being a paradigm of reward and punishment which is that's, that's, it, that's huge that's huge by the way let's not just let that go yeah let's say more okay yeah this this whole idea that the entire culture is centered on rewards and punishment and especially punishments how screwed up is that if if you wanted to design a system say i were to give you or you were to give me 3000 people mixed races mixed gender mixed everything right and and how how am i going to design a society a a town how am i going to put together the the town culture so that it benefits everyone it wouldn't be like it is today well whatever whatever (laughs) i came up with whatever you came up with it's not going to look anything like it does today in a group of three thousand people or 300 people nope nope uh 
And and this is still, I think, what prison systems, they largely rely on in terms of philosophy. Like, how do you make a better citizen, right? Or how do you rehabilitate is the question, right? So you deprive them of the most important relationships, keep them segregated, separated. Um, you You inflict a whole bunch of shame when you... write reports about them and i know this for certain because i worked in the jail system briefly and i wa and i and i listened to the reports that parole officers would write and they were just shame it was just painting the person black uh black in terms of bad right so they would the, the idea was to shame the crap out of them so that they would be like feel awful and so to make a better human you try to make them feel awful to make a better human you take away as many of their liberties as possible. Uh, to make a better human, you punish them in all sorts of ways. Um, I don't know if you've ever read any of the research of B.F. Skinner, a, a behavioralist, and he's a godfather, one of the godfathers, right, of psychology. And I'm pretty sure in his literature, he proved that punishment does not work. <laughs> Right. punishment does not work for And, and teaching he teaching anything. and he did lots of experiments, by the way, He did. focused Yeah. on punishment. He did. Uh, Uh, and I'm pretty I, sure it was conclusively proven that punishment does nothing to help a human be a more skilled, uh, enlightened, productive, whatever, human, right? It doesn't work. It might suppress behaviors temporarily, but it doesn't teach anything new. Right. And, and I think the most important thing, the most important emotion a human being can learn is empathy. And I don't think it can be taught. I think people can learn empathy, but I don't think it can be taught. I don't think I could spend a thousand hours in a classroom scratching away on the board or whatever. And I don't think I could teach empathy, but I think people can learn it. And I think it's really, really important because If I don't have empathy for people who don't look exactly like me and behave exactly like me and have exactly the same amount of money that I have and so on, then how can we improve society at all? I think it has a lot to do with the mother-child relationship, which is often disturbed in capitalism um, because the mother has to go off to work or whatever, or the mother doesn't know anything about mental health or how to be a better, healthier parent uh, because they were never exposed to that information or <clears throat> they don't have the time to learn it. Um, but I mean, if it's modeled to you at the right developmental stage, empathy, compassion, and especially the mother showing compassion to the child, See, I'm showing you compassion. I put my arm on your shoulder. I listen to you. I understand you. So then you're more you're more able to give it to yourself and to others as a result of that experience. But how many kids get to have that experience with their mothers um, and fathers? Like, but primarily the mother. The mother, I think she can deliver that in the most powerful way. How many kids are deprived of that mother attachment, emotional learning? modeling how many kids Almost, almost all of them in this country, right? I, I never had that kind of positive relationship with my mom. that's <laughs> uh, and I, I i i like to give mothers the benefit of the doubt i would say well you you didn't know any better you never got to learn because it was never taught to you right and so this is sort of the heritage of capitalism isn't it It's Yes, a her absolutely. it's a it's a heritage of coldness. It's a heritage of distance. It's a heritage of uh emotional neglect. Uh and then and then also subsequently thinking that it's normal. It's normal to like suppress your emotions and to not work with them and to have no relationship with them. It's <laughs> normal to be uh to to be cut off from that part of yourself. It's normal to experience the consequences. I'm, everything I'm saying is not normal, <laughs> right? Right, right. And we've talked about this before. The, the society, the culture in which we are embedded is completely mismatched to how we want things to be with the, with the society, with the, with the town, with the culture, with the community that we want to be part of. No, it's it's hyper individuality. It's uh, basically it's anti community. I think even though people claim to be in communities, 
I right. don't know if they're if they're actually maybe in some situations briefly they would act as as a community, um, but I mean, why would you have latchkey kids wandering with that without anybody except for their friends who are only available sometimes? Why would you have latchkey kids if there was a community that they could turn to? You why would you have any community that requires latchkey kids? Think about that. That mm -hmm. requires kids to go home alone mm -hmm. at the end of their school day and spend the next two hours or so mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in in Lord of the Flies. <laughs> so all that the kids have, and Gabor Monte talks about this too, all that the kids have is the other kids who don't know anything, right? <laughs> all that they have is the other kids and probably and, the, and their electronics, right? And now that we're not 15 years old anymore, we can look back and see that 15 year olds are not the best models for the lives of our children. No, <laughs> it seemed like a good idea when we were 15, but wow. Right. So I, so I think this actually goes, I mean, this, we can really dig deep with this. I mean, if you have this neglect that you call normal uh, through millions of people, and these people, they don't have a healthy relationship with their themselves, um, which in turn leads to other problems, disorders, uh, difficulties being in relationships, unnecessary stresses. Um, then people are going to look for ways to get relief from these neglects and these stresses. And these ways of coping and these ways of getting relief are probably destructive to themselves and to the environment i mean the person is just looking for relief right <laughs> they need some relief from their suffering so that's their priority their, it's, their priority isn't to think in intellectual ways how can we make the world a better place right no their 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 priority is coping and uh reducing the internal pain um so it turns into all kinds of things that people also judge like substance abuse and other types of coping that are potentially harmful but I mean, when people don't know any better and they've never learned any better, what are they supposed to do? <laughs> right, exactly. Well, I've been pointing out for many years that we are one collectively. We are one. And I'm not just talking about the human community there. I'm talking about all of the natural world, because whatever happens to one of us happens to all of us. You cannot damage a forest without having negative impacts on all of us. That's just the way the world works. Mm hmm. How many people do you think know that? Four? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly didn't grow up thinking, you know, if uh, what are my environmental impacts? Right. I, 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 had a, I had a gut sense that humans were doing it wrong. But I, in all of my little actions and the things that I did, it wasn't conscious to me. And it, it probably still isn't. Like, what if, what did I how did I impact nature today with the way that I lived my life? Um, I don't think I really, that, that must be something that has to be trained in a person, right? Like how to ponder that, like yeah, how, well, how, how do my actions affect the world around me? Yes. You have to think about your role in the universe. You have to think about as an individual, why am I here? What am I doing here? How can I improve the world? How can I improve my life? Right? right? These are these are deeply thoughtful questions that are not allowed in the public school system in this country. Wow. We're not allowed, or it just isn't it isn't brought into the into it, the educational process at all. Like the it's things you the, just said. It's not in the federal standards for teaching in public schools. It's not in the state standards for teaching in public schools. There, We focus on exactly two things in the public school system in this country, and that's by design. And it goes back to the late 1800s when the federal government decided that we should focus on two things, mathematical, logical, and linguistic. Those are two of 10 different kinds of intelligence, mm. as pointed out by Howard Gardner in his mm -hmm. book, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. And he points out that we only, by only focusing on a very thin slice of the kinds of intelligence, we ignore things like 
interpersonal communication. That's communication between me and another person, interpersonal. And there's also intrapersonal. What is my place in the universe? What is my role in my society, in my community? Those are the kinds of the things that we are not to, taught to think about in the public school system. We're, uh, we're, taught, to, we're taught to speak English, and, and the English we speak is completely different than the English you speak, because you put in all those extra U's in words like favor and and extra S's when we use Z's. And I, I don't know what's going on there, but... <laughs> <laughs> but and what but, about environmental intelligence? Oh, not even a thought. Not a thought is given a think <laughs> about when when people were seriously thinking about this in the late 1800s. Nobody was thinking about saving the world. Nobody was thinking about ensuring that the forest that's here today is also here in 100 years or 200 years. No, it was all about exploitation. Capitalism was in first gear by then but we ramped it up a lot since then and calling it normal i guess i want to keep saying that. so leaving all these things out just ignoring important parts of our intelligence calling it normal uh saying that you know if something happens as a result of your capitalist enterprise or ambitions it's not to be of concern because you are, don't worry about that. You're helping the economy. You're helping people get jobs. Don't worry about the, don't even think about other things. All that matters is that you're helping build an economy, get people jobs, right? Uh, you're the good guy. You're the good guy. <laughs> so, and, and not only that, the metric we use for evaluating the economy and how it's doing is these stock market indexes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which has, if if you want to know the relationship between the economy and the natural world, all you have to do is look at the Dow Jones Industrial Active Index, the Dow Jones Industrial In Index. For every tick up, that means we destroyed a few more acres, a few more hectares. That's the it, only way to make progress, I guess, in this yeah, format, right? Absolutely. It's the exact opposite of the way it could be if we were actually thoughtful about this. So this Do is good to know, you know, like, I mean, somebody, some part of nature, whether it be human, animal, or just earth, some part of nature has to pay for progress in this paradigm. You can't progress unless someone else is robbed or suffering. I don't think that's possible. Like, you can't, I don't think you can have a win-win. Like you can't, in this paradigm, I don't think you can serve nature and, 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 and reach all your ambitions and your capitalist goals. I don't think it's possible for those things to coexist. Is no, it? I, I can't imagine a situation in which that would happen. No. Because, because somebody, you in order for you to make profit, you have to be able to take from something else. Yeah, you, like, you, got, that, you got to cut down the trees to make two by fours to make a house and, and if, those trees were serving some sort of function before you <laughs> chop them down and if you take and if you're responsible for all the waste that you emit or create that would cost that would reduce your bottom line and your profit as well so it can't be if you you can't hold people responsible for the waste other or the shareholders would be very unhappy right <laughs> oh. <laughs> i mean so, I mean, it just sort of paints the picture, right? Like that. And I hope as people are hearing this, that you realize that you're, so you were born into this framework. You didn't know how it was harmful. You didn't know the harms that it was doing to you or your family, because these things are left out. They're left in the dark. Um, and science sometimes has a, takes a while to catch up to, pointed out so i mean if things if your family is broken apart if you're struggling with mental health problems or physical health problems i mean it's a good chance it's likely related to living in this way some shape or form um and and not only that the whole system encourages you to make money that's our measure of success right how many privileges you have access to 
Right. That's what defines you as successful within this set of living arrangements. That's or insane. It, or actually, it even goes further than that. I think it's that you have the privilege of existing if you can if you can um, bring money into the system or generate money making, something like that, right? Like if you're homeless, if you don't have an income, if you're not producing, I think you're pretty much considered like irrelevant or yes. uh, or worse. Or... <laughs> you're, a burden. you're a burden on the system. Right, right. Right. Yeah. My my tax dollars have to go to make sure you get a meal every two days. Right. Right. And so for most people, the people who are not making those contributions, those those so-called positive contributions that the rest of us are making, they're the bad people. Mm -hmm. They're not doing their mm -hmm. share. They mm -hmm. need to pull up the steps <laughs> and get back to work. I mean, this is this is the Donald Trump mentality. Oh, of course, yeah. The oh, pull up your bootstraps. Um, that's all that you need. You don't need to learn anything about yourself or become healthy or learn how to do it. No, you just need to pull up those bootstraps. And if you won't, we'll punish you until you do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's the that's that's the long and short of it, isn't it? Uh, for uh, sort of required obedience um in the system um and if you know you, you your options are kind of relatively few you can conform to the system as it is and um be rewarded by the system in the ways it can provide rewards um or you can reduce your level of conformity and experience the consequences um i think everyone's on a spectrum there too like how much do you conform and how much do you conform blindly to the system as it is right how much sure. How much do you um how much do you advocate? How much are you a cheerleader for the for the system as it is? How much do you recognize the consequences? And how much and, and do you or you do, do you just completely discount? Do you hold the system completely innocent? We talked about this in the last video, because right. people will say it's all individual responsibility. The context and the environment has no bearing. They will actually try and eliminate that part of the equation <laughs> in the, the way that they, when you talk about problems at community hall or whatever, right? Like homelessness has nothing to do with the environment, nothing to do with right. the way we live our lives. Right. It's, it's just, it's just the individual's character and their poor character and the, their laziness. <laughs> it's so, I'm sorry, it's stupid. It's stupid because you're not looking at all the variables. Like, right. like, of like, not. Like, like character is part of it, but you can't just eliminate the context and say that it has no bearing whatsoever. Right. And that, you know, childhood has nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah. I would posit that at least 90% of what somebody is doing and, and how everybody perceives their life success or not has to do with the way they were raised and their DNA. How could it be any other way? It's a solid combination of nature and nurture in, in every case, I think. And, and the, this environment does not help our genes express themselves in the best possible way. <laughs> right. In fact, I think it actually does the opposite for many people. And, um, right. and the, um, I don't know. I think the more we ignore what, what we're talking about here today, the more we try to say that, you know, people like Guy and my, myself and Guy are just making stuff up, like, um, the more we put it into the category of crazy or conspiracy, the more, the faster the destruction of the, our life support system will take place. <clears throat> um, oh, but, by the way, one of those men in the Pima County Jail, everybody, everybody called them Z. Mm. which was short for crazy okay <laughs> because he was incarcerated he must be insane he must be crazy mm. right he didn't he didn't have anything to do with that oh if you don't conform to the system you're crazy right like, exactly. for me like biting the hand that feeds and having these you know having all this protest conversation with with guy like of course i must be 
completely crazy. It's just Peter having borderline personality disorder. That's what it is. If he was truly healthy, he would completely conform to the system and, and totally kiss capitalism's ass. <laughs> and speaking of, speaking of borderline personality disorder, why don't we take this opportunity? You can tell us about mm -hmm. your course and we'll wrap this up. Sure. I'd also like to add another resource because I'm I'm uh, I'm not I, I don't like to just put the spotlight on stuff that I've offered um, there in my recent podcast at um, I have a podcast called Smarter Than BPD. But I, in my recent podcast, I spoke of another Canadian. His name is Craig, Greg Dorder. Uh, and he has these thing. Uh, the, he has this YouTube channel called uh, Self Help Tunes, um, and he has some course offerings as well that are uh, they're partly free and partly uh, for purchase. Very reasonable. Um, anyway, he talks about a lot of the same things I talk about for cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical dialectical behavior therapy, and how it can help with borderline personality disorder. He does it really, really well. So I wanted that to be in today's video too. But my 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 resource, my free resource is at freebpdcourse.com. And uh, it outlines everything that I've learned about living uh, with mental health challenges and what to do about it and how to apply both cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, and it's there for anyone to use. And um it's by free or it's free or by donation your choice and i'm happy to give it away so check and it. and i'd like to point out that it's not just you doing the blah 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 in all of these lessons that you no no display. no it's a I, I i purposefully looked for other youtube videos from other professionals and other people who have experienced similar challenges and their those videos are inserted in every a chapter of the course. Um, you'll also find uh, flashcard tools and online quizzes that are related to each part of the content to solidify your learning. Um, what else can I say? Oh, and yeah, I'm linking it to podcast episodes too now. So hopefully it can just, you know, whatever part of it works for you, or if, or, or if my discussion of other resources, if those people can help you, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if it's me or someone else. I just hope that people get help. And are the podcasts linked to your freebpdcourse.com? Yeah, there's a link to it at freebpdcourse.com. There's a right at, uh, near the top of the page. You'll see that uh, there's an image there that you can click on um, to to access those. And um, and because I, I don't say everything correctly or perfectly in the podcast, I've also been doing some podcast newsletter newsletters so think the things i've thought about after i do the podcast that i should have put in the podcast or if i could have worded it better it's in the newsletter <laughs> so there you go that's, that's great and i very much appreciate the service you're providing so thank you well let's wrap things up right there and i look forward to chatting again next week